Church. I'm Tony, giving my wife Lindsay a break today, so she's far, she's far prettier than I am. <laughs> Little break. She did it a couple times without me. Uh, just glad to see you here. I don't know what kind of week you went through. Boy, we went through the ringer. We both had the stomach bug and rolled right into a nasty cold, so we've had a rough week. I know a lot of others are going through the same thing, so glad to see you today. Just a reminder on small groups and Bible studies, we've got a few of those going on right now. If you're interested, just go ahead and put that in your communication card, and then we'll partner on Saturday. An offering, so we don't pass a plate here at Shoreline Church. We have a number of ways to give. You can donate in the box in the back, Sister Jeanette, or also on the shorelinechurch.net. It's an option as well for online giving. This is our first time here. Uh, welcome. We're glad to see you. Uh, we'd love to partner alongside of you and your walk with Christ. It's certainly difficult to do this this life alone so glad to see you a couple a couple announcements just upcoming events foodology this is in the uh, bulletin as well and the mayor's conference those are coming up here uh, later this february and then easter's coming we've got a lot of uh, flyers to send out they're beautiful so continue to pray for that hopefully we see some new faces and uh, like i said uh, introduce people to christ and then there's an infor informational meeting today right after service with Ruthann, we'll talk about camping this summer. We have an awesome set, so here we go. Yeah, please stand. One doorway that leads to life One redemption, one confession I believe in the name of Jesus Christ I believe in the crucifixion By His blood I've been set free I believe in the resurrection Hallelujah, his life is best. All praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King. Jesus, 
could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? All oh, praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome, the King who was and is and evermore will be, in Jesus' mighty name I believe.
crushing of these heavy chains, wipe away every stain. I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. You set me free. Yeah. So I sing of these heavy chains, wipe away. So 
just thank you for this time together this morning as we come together to worship you and to just come before you and just realize that we can't do anything without you, Lord. And we just, we just thank you for showing up when we needed you, Lord, and giving us a way to reconnect to you, to be redeemed to you, Lord, because you are holy. You're holy forever, Lord. You created everything. You created the entire universe, every little light that we see in the sky, every star. You created it, Lord, and that is amazing. It's amazing to think that and you, you go up a little bit, you go like on a mountain, and you just realize like how small you are, and then you like look up and you see all these stars, and you're like, well, how small? How small are we? And and the Lord, Lord, you just you care for us and you love us, and you are our great, wonderful Father. I thank you for that, Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's nice to see you. Thank you for surviving the week. Um, <clears throat> it was, it, there were about 20 people who uh, had various forms of illness this week, so uh, wash your hands. Uh, you know, feel free to cover your mouth and whatever you got to do, right? Just, just got to stay healthy because it's been a, it's been rough. We've had several staff people, myself included, out this week, so uh, I'm hopeful that the Lord just removes it from us and we can just move on and, and get back to, to work. Yeah, and hand to God. Come on, Lord. <laughs> I want to take you back in the Old Testament as a start. We're not going to stay there. We're going to come back into Romans where we've been for a while, but I want to start in the Old Testament at a time of apostasy. Now, that's not the word that we use all the time. Like you don't walk around, you know, thinking about apostasy or saying, oh, I met some apostates today, right? <laughs> That's not really a word that we're familiar with or a word we use all the time, but the idea is actually very easy to understand. It's a time when people have intentionally and knowingly walked away from God. And you see, I think that's something that we can kind of recognize in the world around us, that we are living in a time of great apostasy where people are knowingly, actively, and intentionally walking away from God. And if you go all the way back into the time of the people of Israel, um, there's this guy who's a king, and he's a Jewish king. His name is Ahab. And Ahab is supposed to be a good king. All of the Jewish kings were supposed to lead their people into a correct relationship with Yahweh, the one true God. And Ahab decides he's not going to do that. He's like, nah. And he marries a woman from a different, um, she's a Sidonian, her name is Jezebel. And so right off the bat, you, you should have like a negative association with the name Jezebel. There are not a lot of children named Jezebel in the world because of this negative association. 
And her name actually, like, even her name has some problems with it because she is a worshiper of Baal. Now, you could say it a couple different ways, right? You could say Baal or you could say Baal. It doesn't matter. He's long gone, right? And so this pagan idol is a god of rain and fertility. And the people of the ancient world were very familiar with having like layers of different gods. And so you could have the god of rain and stuff, and that's good. We need him for one thing. And then you could have, you know, Yahweh. Yeah, he's good too. We'll just kind of smash them both together. Well, you remember what the Bible says about that, right? Big Ten Commandments. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. And Ahab decides to marry this woman Jezebel. But in the ancient world, when you married someone, it was a political association. Not necessarily for love, but to advance an agenda. And the agenda is to replace the worship of Yahweh, our God, the one true God, with the worship of Baal. What do you suppose the one true God thinks about that? He has a very firm and decided opinion about that. This is bad. And so Jezebel, they, Ahab and Jezebel, they start this program to systematically kill all of the prophets of Yahweh. They're going around trying to find them, and they're all in hiding. And God is angry about this, and so he basically turns off the rain. Because Yahweh is the one true God. He is the one power in the universe. And God turns off the rain because the rain God is nothing. And so for three years, the prophet Elijah hides. And one of the things that is great about the story, this is 1 Kings 16 to about 20. I mean, go read it this afternoon. It's a great story. Because what God does is he tells Elijah, I want you to go hide in a, widow, in a widow's house in the city of Zarephath, in the region of the Sidonians, where Jezebel came from. It's the center of Baal worship. And so God tells his prophet Elijah, go hide in the middle of a bad place. And Elijah does it for three years. He hides out downtown bad town. No rain. And God feeds him. Now, after three years... There's a confrontation between Elijah and 450 prophets of Baal. Now, they are state-supported prophets. The government is paying their salaries. They are doing the will of the, of the government at the time, trying to eradicate the prophets of Yahweh. And so Elijah, this one guy, goes and they have this contest. And you remember the contest, right? Probably from Sunday school. That Elijah says, here's the contest. You go make a sacrifice, put it on the altar, and you ask Baal to light the fire. And 450 prophets of Baal spend all day jumping around, cutting themselves, looking like complete morons, trying to get their fake God to start a fire. And Elijah's looking at his watch. And then about the time of the evening sacrifice, he says, it's my turn. It's my turn. And he says, he, he gets a sacrifice, puts it on the altar, arranges it, and he says, get me some water. And he says, pour that water all over the wood, all over the sacrifice. Make sure it's completely wet. What do you think is going to happen? Oh, you know what's going to happen. Elijah says, do it again. Twice. Now, have you been camping? Right? Like, would you do this if you were camping? No, you pour gasoline on the fire to get it started like a good camper would. <laughs> A third time, Elijah says, go get more water. Three times, pour water on it. And then Elijah prays. He says, God, show them who you are. And fire comes down from heaven and consumes the offering and the wood and the stones of the altar itself. Wow. That is like the single greatest day of Christian, or well, not Christian, but Israelite ministry, the single greatest day of ministry ever. Could you imagine? I mean, buddy, just a, you guys did an incredible set, right? You're making it a tough act to follow every week. 
And so here we are having this incredible set, great worshipful moment. But can you imagine if I said, okay, let's make an offering here. Set up some wood. Pour water on it. <laughs> have to build the church back square. <laughs> I can't imagine that incredible victory, right? That incredible victory. And do you know what happened to Elijah? Well, they killed the prophets of Baal, right? They, they, they got that out of the way at least. But then Elijah gets a message from Jezebel. She says, I'm going to kill you. How do you think you would respond in that moment, right? That's how I would want to respond, right? Go ahead, lady. Did you just see what God did? Do you know who I work for? You know what Elijah did? He ran away and hid. And he was so intimidated and scared and afraid, he said, God, take my life. He was depressed. He was crushed. After that great victory, he just didn't have any gas in the tank anymore. And so God told him to rest. And God encouraged him. And this is where Paul kind of picks it up. Uh, Paul picks it up. Well, let me, here, here, I'm sorry. 1 Kings 19, 14 says this. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. That's where he's at. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And in, in chapter 11 of Romans, Paul's going to look back at that moment where Elijah thought he was the only one left following after the one true God. And in Romans 11, 4, it says this, I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Because you see, Elijah wasn't alone. He just felt alone. In a time of apostasy, when Israel has rejected their covenant relationship to God and rejected God himself, They've started to worship false gods, but the one true God has preserved a remnant of 7,000 who never bowed their knee or their heart to that false god. The remnant are those who remain faithful and refuse to worship Baal. By reminding the readers of Romans, so we've been talking about the Old Testament, we're coming back into the New Testament now, we're coming back into Romans. Paul is reminding his readers about the time when God's people rejected him and God showed up. He's pointing to that rejection. Of, he's using that to point to the rejection of Jesus by the Jews of his time. He says, hey, look, there was a time of apostasy. And do you remember how our God showed up? And now we are still living in a time of apostasy. And you know what? We, too, so Paul was 2,000 years ago. We, too, live in a time of great apostasy. People have abandoned their faith. Now, church research, researchers have chronicled the rise of different kinds of people, and, and they, they attach tags to them. And one of the, th the tags they attach to people who have left the faith, they call them nuns and duns. Nuns, not N-O-N-E-S, nun. Not N-U-N, spell Catholic friends, different. N-O-N-E-S, nuns. They're the people where if you give them a religious survey and say, hey, what is your religious affiliation? They check none. Okay? That's a nun. You know what a dun is? Somebody who says, yeah, I've been to church. Grew up in church. <laughs> Left the church. There's a lot of duns in the world. You know anybody like that? And so this chart, all you need to notice on here, uh, this is generations on the left side, and it just tr highlights that Americans with no religious affiliation is increasing. That's the world that we live in. There are people who drive by this building every day who never even bother to think about what's happening inside. That's the world that we live in. Now, this is what apostasy looks like. People leaving the faith. Paul is pointing to apostasy to challenge his hearers. And that's what Romans 11 is. Romans 11 is a challenge to the people of faith to maintain their faith to keep committed at a time of apostasy. When we think about the structure of the book of Romans, and this is we've been through this a number of times, we're, we're getting close to the, the final move here. 
And so in the first part of the book of Romans, you remember what it's about. It's about sin, where Paul identifies three different people and their three different responses to God and how none of them measure up, how all of them come short. And then he says what they need is salvation. They need to trust Jesus in order to have a restored relationship to the one true God. And we've, we've been through that. Then we talked about sanctification or transformation and that crucial importance of Romans 5 through 8 for the life of faith. Because if you don't know who you are, it's really hard to do Christian things. And it's really easy to get it backwards, right? It's really easy to point to the ethical parts of Scripture where it tells you what to do and not do and forget that we start from a position of safety and security in this relationship with God. You remember what Romans 5.1 says, don't you? Did you hear her? That's my wife, if you don't know. And so it's my, fav my favorite target. We have, Romans 5.1 says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And like my brain comes to a full stop right after that. There's a comma, but my brain stops right there. And it's like, I need to sit there for just a minute and just remember and reflect on how I have peace with God, not because of who I am or what I've done, but because of who he is and what he's done. Romans 5 through 8 just goes through all of the different things that I have as a believer, as a Christian. And I need those for what comes next. Because Romans, Romans 12 is going to start with the action items, the things we're supposed to do. We're in the, this sovereignty section where Paul is answering the question, what about God's historic relationship to the people of Israel? And he's talking about how those who are the chosen ones are now all of those who believe in Jesus. And so the three sections here, God's uh, reliable promises, Romans 9, Romans 10 is a rescue for all who believe, and now be the remnant. Because I think what Paul wants us to understand is we are always going to be living in a time of apostasy. There are always going to be people around us abandoning and leaving the faith, but not you, right? But not you and not me. No matter what difficulty and danger comes, we need to be the ones who hold on. Paul uses the word grace throughout the book of Romans. The word grace means that, that you are given what you don't deserve. That's what the grace of God means, that we are given what we don't deserve. And he uses that word most often in the uh, salvation section of the book. It's closely related to the word mercy, where you are not given what you do deserve. We use grace and mercy with our children all the time. Last night, a child who lives in my household who will not be named, <laughs> but most of you know who he is, put his, uh, he had a dragon poop, and he left the rind in my wife's closet. Now, it's a, big, it's, a, it's a big room that we use for a closet and a sitting room, so it, it's not like he hid it in the closet or anything, but then he, he brings it to my office, which is also upstairs, and he says, can I leave this here until tomorrow? <laughs> now, grace is to let him have the food at all upstairs in the bedroom areas. Mercy was letting him store it in my office. Maybe even more mercy as I took it down uh, when I took the dog out. Grace and mercy are wrapped up in God's gift of Jesus. We remember Romans 3.21 to 24 or 25 where it says this. There is no distinction. Sorry, this is 22. There is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified. That's a declaration of legal righteousness by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation or a sacrifice of atonement by his blood to be received by faith. How do you get the grace of God? By trusting in Jesus. You receive grace by trusting in Jesus Christ. And so Romans 9 to 11 is answering questions about God's relationship to Israel. And in this section, we're talking about the remnant, be the remnant a warning against apostasy. Okay, we have a lot of text today, so ready? 
All right. I got the nod from Lori back there. I asked then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see, and ears that could not hear to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. And so Paul starts this section with a key question. Did God reject his people? No. God preserved a remnant by his grace. And how do you get the grace of God? By trusting in Jesus. You see, Jesus came to the Jewish people and many of the Jews believed in him and became Christians. But did they lose all of their Jewish identity? No, of course not. Some of them still went to the temple. Paul still went to the temple. They still made sacrifices. Paul took a vow and had to go in and make sacrifices to complete his vow. He still expressed aspects of his Judaism as a Jewish Christian. And so Paul is a Jewish Christian. God's promises uh, to the nation continues in the Jewish people who are saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. And that's where God started out. But not all of the Jewish people believed in Jesus. So Paul looks back in the history of Judaism to the time of Ahab and the time of Elijah, and that's the connection with the story in Elijah, a time when the leadership of Israel was actively undermining devotion to God and the people were going astray. And he says, don't go astray. Make sure that you don't go astray. Paul is calling out his people. And he's doing it on purpose because what he wants, like his agenda item, what he's trying to accomplish in all of this section is to say to the Jewish people, don't you apostatize too. By rejecting God's Messiah, Jesus, the Jews are apostate. But God has continued to be faithful by preserving a remnant, those Jewish people who believe in Jesus. Now, verses 5 and 6 uh, can be a little bit confusing. It talks about chosenness. Um, and the big idea in that sentence is this. There is a remnant. So as Paul looks at the, the church, he looks at this Jewish Gentile organism that is people who are following after Jesus. And how is that connected to the historical people of Israel? Paul says there is a remnant. Not everyone believes the gospel, not everyone believes in Jesus, but all those who do are now the obedient ones who are following God God's way. There is a remnant. The word chosen is a noun, uh, which is hard to render in English. The word grace is emphatic, and so they are the grace chosen ones. How do you get chosen by God's grace? You believe the gospel. And then you, too, are the grace chosen ones. The ones who are chosen are the ones who believe in Jesus Christ, the ones who come to God his way. And what happens to the rest? Paul uses a word called hardening. And hardening, uh, the definition is this. The action of hardening one's heart or the state of hardness of heart is the action or state of persistent and sometimes hostile rejection of the word of God. Hardened belief goes back to the prophets. You see, the people of Israel were supposed to follow after the one true God, and God gave them the law and said, here, do this. And then they looked at the law and they said, that's great, and they didn't do it. And so God had priests that were there to instruct them in the law, and he said, I'm going to have to send some prophets. Now, a prophet is a person who's sort of a, like a covenant policeman. He's the guy who shows up when you have wandered away from the covenant and says, excuse me, sir, you're going a little fast today. You ever have that happen? You're going a little bit fast, and you get to have a conversation with a nice officer, 
happened to me one Easter morning as I was on my way back to church from getting my coffee. And I asked him if we could snap a picture, and he did. And I showed everybody at church. See, I got in trouble this morning. Talked myself out of a ticket. But when the covenant policeman comes, he says, hey, you are not obeying the law of God. And prophets had to speak to regular people. They had to speak to kings. They had to speak to people in authority and say to people like Ahab, you are not going in the way that God wants you to go. That sounds like a fun job, doesn't it? Just calling people out all day long. I think I've seen some prophets on Facebook from time to time. <laughs> Hardened unbelief is a theme in the prophets. Don't be a stiff-necked people. And the Israelites don't listen. And so Paul reminds his readers of this theme from the prophets. God did not reject his people. Paul's point is that apart from the remnant, the people rejected God. And they face the threat of being hardened by that. So imagine you have a difficult neighbor. <clears throat> Maybe you have a difficult neighbor, I don't know. But imagine you have a difficult neighbor and, you know, their dog sort of wanders into your yard from time to time. Or their kids are always dropping balls in your yard. They're always over there doing stuff and you're, you're kind of like tired of it. So you decide... After a couple of polite conversations, right? That's because we're adults. We're supposed to say, hey, maybe you could not have your dog visit my yard. That would be nice. You decide to put up a fence. And so you, you go out and you pick up a nice chain link fence. And it doesn't work. But that's the beginning of hardening, right? Like you're trying to keep something from impinging on you or coming into your area. You put up this chain link fence and all of a sudden that dog is like he's running an excavator. And he's under the fence like you wouldn't believe it. And those kids, you know kids don't stop at a fence. You ever see kids? Like I live on a corner lot and I've got kids who just kind of like cut through my yard. <laughs> oh, I'm on them. <laughs> I'm thinking about a fence. <laughs> so you decide, you know, you got this neighbor, this problem, and you're like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to solve this problem. I'm going to put up a privacy fence, and I'm going to dig down, I'm going to take that chain link fence, and I'm going to bury it. I got four feet of chain link under the ground, six feet of privacy fence. Dog problem solved. But you know what those neighbor kids are going to do? They're going to start playing volleyball right beside your fence. You know what happens when kids play volleyball, right? The balls keep coming over, and do those kids have the presence of mind because they're children, right? To go around the fence? No, they go over the fence because they have a trampoline too. <laughs> and so they're just bouncing all over your fence and you're like, this is just ridiculous. I can't, I can't put up with this any longer. You put up a 12-foot steel barrier fence topped with razor wire and then you drape netting over the top and you have completely solved your kid problem. There's a couple volleyballs hung up in the razor wire, but that's fine. They're children. They'll get through it. You've solved the problem. But you see, that's what hardening looks like. And the people of Israel haven't kept pesky kids out of their yard. They've rejected God. They've built this fortress by uh, just deciding to follow rules and making all these, these things. They've built this fortress that God can't seem to speak to them through. That's what hardening looks like. And the warning for you and I is not to block out God. Don't be like them. Be the remnant. Hardening is a warning for the Jewish people. And Paul brings it up from their history. And he says, my, my family, my friends, my people, we've had this problem before. God help us if we have it now that Jesus has come. What's the warning for us as non-Jewish Christians? Don't harden your heart towards God. Learn from the examples of Scripture, good and bad, which means you need to spend time studying and thinking and learning either on your own or in groups. Be sensitive to your own blind spots. Be gentle when you see others struggling in, the, in their faith. Because God help us if we are not the remnant. If Jesus were to come back and find that we had hard hearts, God forbid. Be the remnant. Because apathy can catch you.
Join me, if you would, at verse 11. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion be? I am talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You don't support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. The fruit or the branches in the tree. This section has a warning to the Gentiles. You stand by faith. Don't become arrogant. Don't believe that because you are now uh, saved and a Christian and doing the right thing that you are somehow able to exclude other people. After all, could God not graft back in those branches that were cut off? Of course he could. The first question that Paul asks is, did God reject his people? And the answer is no. You see, the Jewish people thought that the Messiah was coming to them, and they forgot that the Messiah was coming through them. His second question is, did they stumble in order that they might fall? His answer is, again, no. The Jewish rejection of the Messiah opens salvation for the Gentiles. It doesn't allow us, their rejection doesn't allow us to write anybody off because God can bring anybody back into a relationship to him through Jesus Christ. And so Paul urges the Christians not to look down on the Jews for their rejection of Jesus. No Christian should be arrogant about their salvation. Even in the ancient world, grafting good branches onto bad bran or onto good trees was a common practice. Now, I'm not a gardener, but I have the internet. And so um, what I've learned is that you can graft things together. You can take a branch that is doing well. You say, and I don't know what a good branch looks like, right? Apple, tell me some apple stories, right? There's, we have apple trees in the area, and there are good branches and bad. You can take this branch that's doing really well, and maybe the root has a problem. You can take that good branch, and you can put it to a good tree, and then all of a sudden it's bearing fruit. And you know what else you can do? You can take a pear branch on an apple tree and get pears and apples. That's great. Who, who wouldn't want both pears and apples from the same tree? If you have a small yard, you can have pears and apples and something else. It has to just fit the right kind of species, right? There's a tree with 40 different kinds of fruit. There's actually, according to the internet, a plant where you can take the top of a cherry tomato plant and the bottom of a potato plant and smush them together and get tomatoes and potatoes from the same plant. <laughs> what could God do with his church? How could God graft people into his community? Jews, Gentiles, pagans, barbarians, all different kinds of people come together in his church. And so Paul says, do not be arrogant. I think the remedy for arrogance is actually humility. And I think it's like, think about who is your cherry tomato potato person, right? Because I, I know some of you pretty well, and, and, and some of you uh, maybe we haven't even really met for the first time. You look pretty normal for the most part. Uh, okay, maybe some of you feel a little awkward I don't know <laughs> who's the weird person to you who's the person who's an outsider to you we all have an outsider you know who's the outsider to you if somebody were to walk in and I don't know they were a truck driver would you feel comfortable with that person 
the joke is I used to be a truck driver. <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've sat in a lot of rooms full of truck drivers and just listened and not felt very comfortable. <laughs> Can they come to church? Can they come to Christ? Are they going to stop being weird? <laughs> Who's a wild olive branch to you? You see, Christianity is open to all who trust Jesus. And I think that is, that, that's an idea that sometimes we miss out on or we, we don't quite catch, right? Because we get, we get enculturated to one another. We get comfortable with one another. We start to look like one another. Me and Buddy are twins today. Because <laughs> we're wearing our shoreline quarter zip. We didn't, we didn't arrange that. <laughs> we matched last week. Here you go. <laughs> you know, the key word for outreach is out. The key word for outreach is out. You see, what we do here, this is, this is for Christians, but we have a mixed group. I don't know that everybody here is a Christian, and that's okay. We're glad that you're here, right? But the key word for outreach is out. What you do outside this building, there are people who will connect with you and be around you. Maybe you're weird in your own little special way, and you go out in the world, and you're around other weird people, and you know what? They need Jesus. Well, they're not going to come talk to me. They're going to talk to you, and you're out there. The key word for outreach is out. What happens if you never see people who are different from you? What happens if you never put yourself out there? What happens if you're always just surrounded by Christians? Outreach doesn't happen. Somebody might be the, the weird tomato potato person that we need or that God needs. You see, the people of Israel were arrogant. And in their arrogance, they rejected Jesus. God forbid that we as Gentile Christians have the same problem, that we get arrogant and exclusive and have a private club of our own. No, no, no. This is an open. We want people. We want to love people because that's what Jesus did. Arrogance rejected Jesus. Humility bows before him and does his will. And his will is to help other people follow Jesus. We stand by faith. And our faith should be humble. And so Paul moves from this hardened rejection of Jesus by the Jewish people to a warning for us. We stand by faith. And then finally, be the remnant. Stay focused on your faith. Look at verse 22. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those that fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, the Jewish people, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call are irre irrevocable. Just as you who were once at one time disobedient to God and have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so now they too have become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Thank God for his mercy. Do Jewish individuals who reject the Messiah have an ongoing relationship to God? No, that's what being cut off is. There is only one way for you to have a right relationship to God, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. It is by trusting in Jesus, that and that alone. Amen. And there are Jewish people who have rejected the Messiah, rejected God's Messiah, and deal with the consequences for that. And there are Gentile people who have done that. And there are people who are just people, people. 
If you reject Jesus, that is bad. And so Paul looks at those Jews and he says they have been broken off for unbelief. And then he turns it into a warning for you not to make the same mistake. For you not to become one of the nuns or the duns. God forbid. Because I think we've seen in our own children and grandchildren and families, we've seen them walk away from the faith. Don't ever lose hope that God will bring them back. People are saved by faith in Christ. And Paul envisions a future time where the Jewish people accept Jesus rather than continue in their rejection. That doesn't mean that people who die, Jewish people who die, without trusting the Messiah, get a free pass. That does mean that in some point in the future, Paul sees the nation of Israel going, how could we have missed this? And as a group, trusting in the Messiah, Jesus. Lord, hasten that day, right? Because if the church is supposed to be the place where God's kingdom flourishes and grows, where we learn how to have good relationships with one another, where we learn how to encounter and get through hard times together, if that's what this is supposed to be, then shouldn't everybody be a part of it? And shouldn't we, who are a part of it, reach that high bar so that we are doing what God wants us to do and being who God wants us to be? You see, the Bible wasn't written to be some abstract book that we just peruse from time to time. It was meant to change you and me into someone different. In the present time, Paul describes the Jewish people as enemies. That's his time. At his time, the Jewish people were persecuting Christians for their faith in Christ. Their hardened rejection of Jesus as Messiah and King led to persecution of Christ's followers, led to Paul being persecuted. You know what Paul would do? He would go into the synagogue, he would preach Jesus, and sometimes they would beat him. And you know what he would do the next week? He would go into the synagogue and he would preach Jew Jesus to Jewish people. Even if he caught a beating, he would continue to go and he would continue to preach about Jesus Christ. God give us that kind of fervor. Paul warns the Christians that the Jewish people are still loved because of their special relationship through the patriarchs. And so we should never give up hope that the Jewish people as a nation wake up one morning and realize that Jesus is the Messiah. Let's go back to these two ideas. Through faith in Christ, anyone can receive God's grace and his mercy. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, and we have received grace in Jesus Christ. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve, and by God's mercy, we do not get the punishment that we, re we deserve. And so Paul takes this and he uni universalizes the sin of everybody. He says, for God has bowed everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. And you know, when you have received mercy, it's not like, hey, guess what I got today, you know, mercy. And you didn't get it. That's not how mercy works. And when you found a source of mercy in your life, you could be like, hey, guess what I've got? I found mercy. And you know what? It's for you too. So that God may have mercy on them all. Paul hopes that the Christian church, Paul hopes that we will church so well that the Jewish people will want what we have. Romans 11 is a comfort to Jewish Christians and a warning. I'm sorry, Romans 11 is a comfort to Jewish Christians, a challenge to, Jew to Jewish Christians and a warning to the Jewish Gentile church. God has been faithful to his promises to Israel, but God requires ongoing trust in Jesus for a relationship with him. You know any nuns and duns? I do. I actually, I, I like nuns and duns, right? Because I hope that they will realize that the church is still for them. And I, I try to interact with them. We have nuns and duns over for dinner all the time. Um, we like that because we want to challenge them or at least understand why are you done what happened that you left the faith what happened that you have no faith at all oh, I just never thought about it you, you should probably think about that right a, a new phenomenon some of the nuns and duns are becoming um, I don't make these words up folks 
Some of the nuns and duns are becoming ums. You see, after the pandemic, you remember the pandemic, right? People are kind of like, I feel like I need something. Hmm, I wonder what that is. I feel like I need something where people of all different backgrounds, ethnicities, nationalities come together to worship God. I wonder where that happens. It's almost like they've forgotten what church is and what church does. And they've sort of struggled. How do I, how do I break in again? That's where people are. The alms feel disconnected from the church, but they long for a connection to the church. Post-pandemic weirdness has people uncertain about lots of things, and the church is one of them. Like, okay, what happens if somebody gets COVID? What are we supposed to do? Oh, gosh. What's the standard again? Because they've changed it 87 times. There's talk about changing it again. And which standard does this church follow? Do whatever the CDC says. I just don't want to deal with it. And I'm so tired of the pandemic. Aren't you? Think about the scheduling thing. You know, everybody fills their life with things. And if uh, I used to work as a truck driver, and on Sunday I would have to go to work, and sometimes I would stop by the grocery store during church because I had to leave early, and I would stop by the grocery store. And you know what happens on Sunday morning at the grocery store? People are shopping. I mean, they are aggressively shopping. Moms, kids, dads, they're all getting that shopping done on Sunday morning. They have something to do. And if you're going to start the habit of being in church, you're going to have to break the habit of shopping on Sunday morning. That's the world that we live in. Oh, I don't know when I'm going to get that shopping done because Sunday afternoon we have whatever. Our lives are full. I think what this phenomenon means the um phenomenon is there's a lot of opportunities out there because there's a lot of people who are looking for an opportunity to get into church, but they don't quite know how to do it. We just have to have the confidence and the boldness to invade that space because God forbid that Jesus come back and find that we have become apostles that we've let apostasy and a lack of enthusiasm and passion and fervor for the one true God erode us as a church. You see, the church is supposed to be an advancing opportunity to be in the world as a, an outpost, surrounded by apostasy, surrounded by the enemy, surrounded by all kinds of things, and yet passionately committed to do what God wants us to do and be what God wants us to be right here and now. So that apostasy, oh, that doesn't happen here. We don't do that. We don't do that. We always close out with four questions, and the four questions are these. What is God speaking to you from this text today? As you think about Romans 11, as you think about Romans 9 through 11, there are warnings for the Jewish people about having their hearts grow cold, about building walls, about having these problems that they don't overcome. God forbid that's true for us. But if God is speaking to the hardness of your heart, then let's get that straight. Guard yourself. Make a connection to the church part of your non-negotiable routines. Don't become a nun or a dun or an um. Be humble. Be humble in your faith. Because once you were outside and God has brought you in by his son Jesus, be humble. Be open. You might meet a cherry potato person today who needs Jesus and who's ready for a change. What do you need to do about it? Is there something that has to, that's the second question. Uh, do you need to change your heart? Is there something in your attitudes that prevents you from thinking about people the right way? Do you have a whole lot of others in your mind and heart that maybe God is challenging you on? Do you have to change your habits? Do you have to get out and do something different with different people? How can we help? How can we as a church help you make those connections? And one of the things that we're doing this week is foodology, right? And the purpose of so foodology is basically a cooking and eating experience 
Mm. I could probably talk for 10 more minutes about eating, and then you'd all of a sudden be thinking about it, wouldn't you? A cooking and eating experience, but you know what you can do? You can bring somebody who's not part of the church. And then you have them, I mean, they're going to eat. Because once you've made it, it takes a, a while to eat it, to make it, right? You've got to make this food, and you're making it with a bunch of people, and after a while, you're hungry. you got time to talk. So where do you go to church? So how can I pray for you? All those are easy questions, right? How can we help? We put these events on so that we can help you make connections with people. Finally, who else needs to hear about it? God's doing a work in your life, and I know he is. How, do you ha how can you talk about it? Who can you tell about it? I get emails and, and text messages from people that God's working in their life. I get emails and texts from people who need me to pray for them, and I am so thankful that I am uh, allowed that privilege of praying for you. And so feel free to let me know what's going on in your life so that I can be a part of it and pray for you. As we close the service out today, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for all that you've given us in your son Jesus. Lord, as we think about Romans uh, throughout the day and throughout the week, help us, Lord, to not just have it in our minds, but live it in our lives and have it burned into our hearts, Lord, so that we can never, never, never risk apostasy, Lord, so that we never risk becoming a nun or a don or an um. Help us to be a passionate, enthusiastic follower of you, Lord, and help us as a community, Father, to be characterized by joy and happiness and fun and love, Lord. Help us to go through the good and the bad times together in Christ's name. Hey, please stand and sing with us. Darkness tries to roll over my bones. When sorrow comes, to steal the joy I own. When broken.
We don't have to be afraid. We can not, not have fear when we go out and witness, right? Let's, uh, let's invite the, those other branches in. You guys have a good week. We'll see you.